I'll go back. Now, listen. Listen, uh, listen, everyone, this is very important. Uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago, uh, Claire Danes was on the show, who's a lovely woman, very famous actress, beautiful, uh, had a film out, I loved it, it was great, everyone in show business loves each other, and... <laughs> but she's very nice, and she was saying that her father-in-law was a professor of philosophy at the University of Texas uh, in Austin, and the University of Reading in England, that he was uh, at the forefront of developing a type of uh, philosophy or a school of philosophical thought called moral particularism, which I had never heard about, and I'm guessing many of the hobos are also <laughs> a little confused by. I understand you at home, no, no, you're like, oh, moral particularism, <laughs> Leno did that last week. I know, but <laughs> I was fascinated by the idea of perhaps talking to a professional philosopher. I've never met a professional philosopher before. I've pretended to be one in bars. <laughs> But that was to get sexual favours from drunk women. <laughs> but now, this is uh, where I'm going to talk to, uh, well, he's a professor. Uh, professor Jonathan Dancy, everybody. Jonathan Dancy. Well, that's show. a much better reception than I normally get from my students, I wish to well, say. Well, now, the philosophy... Now, well, the, here's my question, actually. Uh, you, so, you, you teach moral philosophy, is that... Uh, or philosophy? Yes. All philosophy or just moral philosophy? Mainly moral. Now, what's the difference between moral philosophy and perhaps just a broader, uh, why are we here, philosophy, then? Well, moral philosophers are interested in the, the, what it is to be right and what it is, is to be wrong. Which actions are right and which are wrong and how they get to be so. So, how do you define right and wrong? You then? don't. You don't define right no, and wrong. that would be a great mistake. So would <laughs> I. <laughs> Thank God I've never made that one. The, uh, that, that sounds a bit... Is, is it, is it, does it have well, its source suppose, in the... You mustn't suppose that we're always interested in definitions. Right. Defining things doesn't do much. When you're trying to understand something, a definition wouldn't give you the understanding. It would exp uh, sort of be the understanding you already had. Right, so you would get someone to... Well, that's what I consider understanding. When someone says something I agree with, I think they're clever. <laughs> yes, well, I think they're right. Yeah. <laughs> We're just, well, just coming at it from a different point of view, then. All right, so you, you are a, a moral particularism, is that right? I'm a moral particularist. Oh, right. Now, yes. for, those, uh, for, the, for the one or two hobos in the audience that don't understand, they, imagine, imagine I didn't understand what a moral particularist was, and I had mm -hmm. the IQ of a ten-year-old seal. <laughs> Then I have no hope. Right, well, right. Uh, but sort of moving up a bit. Right. Um, you want me to tell you what this is? I, if you could, in, okay. in a layman's term. The normal idea about morality is that there are moral principles that somehow determine what is right and wrong to do. Right, from religious standpoints no, or legal no, standpoints? No, or? no, moral principles. Principles such as it's wrong to lie, it's, it's right to take care of others, these sorts of basic principles that most people are taught to live their lives by. By society or religion or by, law? Or by their parents, normally. Or their parents, right. Yeah. I would consider I mean, that society, wouldn't you? Um, it's a rather small society. All right, then. <laughs> uh. <coughs> So, the idea is there must be these moral principles, and that's what makes it possible for there to be a distinction between right and wrong actions. Right. If there were no principles, there'd be no difference between right and wrong. Right. But I think the difference between right and wrong needs no help from principles at all. So, particularism is the view that the distinction between right and wrong actions in no way depends upon there being any moral principles. The link between moral principles and being moral, or being a good agent, being a morally good person, is a mistake. I don't understand, because if you have... Oh, yeah, they'll laugh at me like you understand. If you have a distinction between right and wrong, there has to be... That is morality, isn't it? Well, that's a, morality is a strange word to throw in there. Right. There are some... Some actions are right and some are wrong. By whose definition? We, aren't, we started out agreeing we weren't going to do definition. All right, all right. Well, that seems like a bit of a cheat, to be honest, but fair enough. <laughs> Well, I, I, it's my rules here. Oh, okay, fair enough. <laughs> so, let, let's try, let's try an, another example for a minute. All right. Some jokes are funny and some are not funny. Wow, now you've got me interested. Yeah, yeah. all right. <laughs> See. Um, and we can tell the difference, by and large. Are there any principles of humour? Yes, the letter K is funny. There you go. <laughs> That's about all one can do. Right. Are, um, but that's just a guess. I mean, right, the, the, most times the letter K works, but sometimes it doesn't. 
That's right. So it's funny on some occasions and not on others. Right. There's no principle saying which occasions it's funny on and which it's not funny on. Ah, that's as it were. beginning to, uh, the fog is clearing a little bit. So what you're saying then that morality may be dependent on time and uh, situation. Yes, context. A, f a feature that, so that mainly counts in favour, like um, that it's helpful to others or something like that, sometimes it, you shouldn't be being helpful. Help being helpful is the wrong thing to do. Yeah. But it's helpful is, you know, something that makes the action worse rather than better. I mean, suppose you're walking along the street and you see somebody breaking into a car. You don't say, let me help you out there. Right. <laughs> Not anymore, I don't, no. anyway, certainly, yeah. <laughs> You were, you were brought up in Glasgow. Yeah, that's right. I was brought up like that, yeah. <laughs> so, so sometimes it's right to help and sometimes it's wrong to help. Sometimes it's right to lie, even, right. even to one's wife. I, I could well, really look, let's take it in a pop culture stance then. Let's look at uh, the, uh, the gentleman golfer who shall remain nameless. We're going to do a little bit of fun, right? Right? I think now I'm there's a situation where a man is, is there a morality, because many people would say there was a, a moral catastrophe within that marriage, would that be correct? Well, I, sort of, I, I wouldn't like to say so in public. Right, well, <laughs> it's, it's going to work against you on television. <laughs> but, the, uh, but, but, I, but I, well, not, do you then define actions, do you walk around, you professor, walk around with, I have a set of morals, I will decide what's right and wrong for other no. people? No. As a, as a philosopher, I'm not in the business of telling people how to live, I'm in the business of trying to understand something. Right. What I'm trying to understand is, what it is for actions to be right and what it is for them to be wrong, how they get that way. One answer is, they get it because of principles. I'm, as it were, in the business of fighting that answer. But right. I'm not in the business of telling individuals how to leave, live their lives. That's not what moral philosophers do. In fact, most moral philosophers are singularly ill-equipped to do that. I'm glad you <laughs> said that because... But then, who is equipped uh, to, to advance the... Uh, what if, if you take, for example, the idea of a psychopath, right? Yeah. Someone who has no empathy for other people and will do exactly what they want at any point, at any time, as long as it makes them feel better. Mm -hmm. Is there any way of imparting a moral... Um, a, as grant on top of that, a, a, a no. set of instructions. No, I doubt it. So it's so then, therefore, is personally defined. All morality is personally defined. Well, that's an enormous leap. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that there are some people who don't have the capacity for moral judgment because they're uh, impaired in certain ways, let's say, right. uh, doesn't show anything whatever about how people who are normally equipped operate. And but defined normally. Why? Well, because you're in the business, you're in the business of understanding things, and if you're going to use a word like normal, which is a vast generalization, then you must say what normal is and what normal is not. That would be particular to the situation, would it not? No, it wouldn't. <laughs> okay, you make a fair point. <laughs> the well, let's go back to the psychopath. What was, the, right. point, what was the point about the psychopath? Well, the psychopath is someone who has no mm. empathy, right? So yeah. uh, These people exist, and you cannot get them started on moral distinctions. They just don't get it. Right. But most people get it all right. Uh, you know, their judgment is, like all our judgments, somewhat wobbly. They, get, right. they make mistakes. They're not sure what to do. They're not sure in certain circumstances whether something matters or doesn't matter. They're trying to like, hold it all together as best they can. Right. And if you said, well, now, who would you go to for help? I think that's where we were, wasn't it? Right, yeah, yeah. You know, would, you go, would you go up to a philosophy department and ask for the, you know, the, the, the home moral philosopher and ask for a bit of advice? I don't think that would be a wise place no, to I go. No, don't, I don't think so either. Well, I mean, I'm paid to do something, but it's not that. Right. Um, what exactly is it, then? But, <laughs> Do you want to answer that question or the other one? No, I think, um, <laughs> yeah, both. Uh, but, we, but we're out of time, so I, I'm in this terrible quandary now of I want to know the answer, but we, I have well, to show a commercial and I don't really know what okay, to do. Okay, there's a large philosophical conference in San Francisco this weekend. You could come. I'd love to go to that. What, what happens at a philosophical conference? Lots of arguing? Yes. I, I do fancy that as an idea. I thought uh, you were. Sounds like my childhood, actually. <laughs> You'd be surprised the sort of people who turn up there and... I don't think I'd be that surprised. <laughs> Would you be happy in a, in a convention of 500 philosophers? If it's a daunting thought. Well, yeah, I mean, who defines philosopher? I mean, is it defined by an academic standard or you just in say this, you are? In this case, it's defined by who employs you, largely. Right. <laughs> but, so, but do you say, well, look, I've got a certain amount of qualifications here. I passed this exam, this exam, and this exam. Uh, I'm now a philosopher. Or can you say I'm a philosopher because I've got my own hat? You know what uh, I mean? 
I, actually, I don't know whether... This is a meeting of the American Philosophical Association, right. and I'm not sure how you get into that, whether you can just, you know, pay your dues and be a member. But if you can, you can come to the to the convention. Well, I could see I was like Descartes. I was like living my life as an experiment. I was a philosophical experiment myself. And then they'd have to let me in. Um, I think you'd then be the subject matter rather than the um, expert. <laughs> it would still get me in the parties though, wouldn't it? There was, a, there was once a session two or three years ago, I think, when um, somebody who ran a brothel came and gave a talk. I'm very pleased to hear you say that. <laughs> And this was, for a, this was for a serious reason, I have to say. But right. I didn't myself ha go and listen to it because I felt that I might be going for the wrong reason. <laughs> You're overthinking this, man. You're overthinking it. Go, oh, get about it. You, you, hey, if you're going for the wrong reason but you get the right result, hey, who, who loses? Uh, the result is good, but you may not gain the credit. Ah, I see what you mean. You're worried about how you appear amongst the other philosophers. No, no. I didn't mean credit in that sense. I, mean, I meant that... Um, it's a standard idea that doing, doing the right thing for the wrong reason means that um, you were not showing in doing that the qualities of character that go with being a good man. I find this subject fascinating and, and I think we could discuss it endlessly. However, we have to sell the sham one. Uh, <laughs> Would you, would, you, would you do me the honour of coming back at some point and, and discussing it further? Uh, yes. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you. And please enjoy the conference this weekend. The, the very the remarkable Jonathan Daz here, everybody. We'll be right back. Well, there are certain things you can't determine, can't, aren't there? Well, yeah, there's chance, right, yeah, but, that's, chance. but that's chance, that's not in your will, though. Like, your will, it, it, you, you make choices, it's the, the Kierkegaardian either-or conundrum, right? That any decision you make will have a percentage of regret attached to it. Will I get a tattoo? Will I not get a tattoo? Perhaps 80% uh, of the regret of getting a tattoo you would experience, but perhaps 80% of not getting the tattoo is the regret. Do you see where I'm going with this?